Arabic scholars will say the word kaif cannot be adequately translated into English given the language's limitations. Remember, Arabic is the language with 160 words for camel. In classic Victorian English, one might say passive enjoyment of mere sense, the pleasant languor, the dreamy tranquility. Well, in today's best English, it means relaxation, rest, perfectly happy, absence of troublesome conversation, and unpleasant memories. In essence, it's leisure. Of course, all these states are more easily attained with the water pipe or hookah or nargile, also known as shisha, goza, and kilian. The pipe was immensely popular among 19th century painters, and they loved to use it in their paintings. It became synonymous with the Orient. The incredible image you are looking at is a detail from a larger work which we'll see later, but the figure is in a pleasant state of kaif and painted by Spanish artist Jose Viega Cordero in 1872. The most often asked question is, what are they smoking? There are a variety of choices, tobacco, hashish, marijuana, opium, or a creative combination of any of them. Another example of the pleasures of the hookah is seen in this work by Italian artist Nicola Forciallo. It does not appear to be evident what the figure is smoking, but he does appear relaxed and mellow, with his companion behind him apparently having a cup of tea or coffee. This small work by Jean Le Comte de Nuit does address the question about content through its title, The Opium Smoker. Not after Columbus's discovery of the New World in 1492 did tobacco and smoking get introduced into the Mid and Far East. Previously, opium in China was eaten and only by the elite and the wealthy. The introduction of smoking hastened its use among lower classes. The popularity of including hookahs in Orientalist paintings created a desire in Europe, especially among writers, poets, and artists in France. Prominent figures like Gautier and Baudelaire were members of a clandestine smokers group called Club des Hachiches, who met regularly for smoking sessions in Paris. Gautier was quoted, Hashish is replacing champagne. Its exotic and oriental symbolism became so ingrained that by 1865, it found its way as a signature prop in Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, with a caterpillar seated on a mushroom, hookah tube in hand, smoking away. When the viewer contemplates Orientalist paintings, exquisite detail comes to mind. This tiny 13 by 9 inch masterpiece by French artist Charles Bard, painted in 1877 entitled Arab Dealer Among His Antiquities, is an explosion of surfaces, brass, silk, carpet, marquetry, tiles, leather, ivory, and the figure's garments. Although the dealer appears to be engaged in a business transaction, he is still holding his Goza style pipe. It perhaps enhances his sales pitch. A second example by the Spanish artist Jose Viega Cordero depicts a figure in an extreme state of kaif with his pipe in hand. This style consists of a bowl made of clay or earth and a long cherry stick stem. The artist's preoccupation with opulent items and textures is evidence in this work. In this small work by Viega Cordero, it appears the blissful state of kaif has not yet been achieved 
by the apparently disgruntled figure. He might have to adjust the mixture of his pipe's content. This is one half of a complex image drawn from a work of literature entitled Persian Letters. The story of a palace eunuch guarding the harem. They were, in fact, castrated as a child to ensure the safety of the harem girls. Jean Le Comte Nui entitled the work The Dream of Kashru, which is the figure's name. His enhanced state of kaif has generated his dream of Zalid, a woman he cannot be with. All he has is his pipe in hand and his dream. Hence, the origin of the term pipe dream. This is a second unique piece by Le Comte Nui, entitled Gates of the Seraglio, which is a word for palace, a government building, or a castle. The figures are guards for the building, and I suppose are taking a break. The feeling of calm, subdued, lighting, and the figures in various states of tranquility communicates kaif. The seated figure in the lower right is smoking from a beautiful goza pipe, while the figure on the top of the steps, possibly the head guard, is smoking from a long stem chibuk. Le Comte de Nuit's mastery of Orientalism cannot be questioned. This is a stunning example of wood latticework known as a mashrabia. In the Middle East, at this time, wood was rare, and rich latticework like this was a sign of great wealth. Again, we see the master of masters, Jean-Léon Jérôme, and a work only 14 by 9 inches entitled Arnaud Fumé. From an outside view, this compartment juts out over the street so that those inside can see activity below on the street without being seen. This complex latticework was challenging but a favored subject for the artists. The seated figure is an armed guard smoking an enormous nargyle pipe. An artist's sense of humor is seen in this additional piece by Jerome, with a guard seated and leaning forward. In the full image, he's blowing smoke in his dog's face. The bared teeth certainly indicates the dog is not pleased by his master's action. Hopefully, the many sides of Kaif are presented here. In today's world, it seems the miracle of modern chemistry has achieved similar states of bliss and harmony without the dangers of smoking. 18th and 19th century Russia was incredibly diverse with a hundred different languages spoken within its historically ever-changing borders and an equal number of distinct and separate ethnic groups, many nomadic. One such group were the Cossacks who grew out of the Ukraine. Their name was a Tartar word for free man. One description reads, quote, their descent was from the Ukraine. They chose freedom over servitude. They evolved from nomadic tribes into an autonomous military states. They cherished their freedom above all else, prized the institution of primitive collectivism, and gloried in heroism on the battlefield." End of quote. A specific group of Cossacks called Zaborzhi resided in the Dnieper River region. Images of them, painted by many great Russian artists, usually depict them at war. Over centuries, they waged war on the Mongols, the Tartars, the Turks, the Poles, and even Tsarist Russia. Another brutally relevant quote today, the Zaborzhi people have a long tradition of making life a living hell for whoever chooses to make war on them. 
Ilya Repin is a name revered throughout Russia as one of the greatest 19th century painters whose skill and influence is felt to this day. He was born in 1844 in roughly the same region of the Ukraine as depicted in his masterpiece, Zaborzy Cossacks, writing a mocking letter to the Turkish Sultan. Painted from 1880 to 1891. We will be studying this six and a half by 11 and a half foot masterpiece that took Repin 11 years to paint. In 1878, Repin saw a letter that inspired this piece. In its description, the artist envisioned the potential for a major painting of epic importance. But first, the background. In 1670, Poland was forced to surrender to the Turkish Sultan lands which included the Zaporzhi region of the Ukraine. Soon after, the Sultan sent word to the Cossacks demanding they surrender and submit to Ottoman rule. The Cossacks refused and the Sultan sent an army of 15,000 troops to teach the band of nomads a lesson. The Cossacks slaughtered all 15,000 troops. Presented here are select passages from the Sultan's next demand for surrender. Quote, the Sultan, son of Muhammad, brother of the sun and moon, godson and viceroy of God, ruler of Macedonia, Babylon, Jerusalem, Upper and Lower Egypt, Emperor of Emperors, Sovereign of Sovereigns, Extraordinary Knights, Never Defeated, Guardian of the Tomb of Jesus Christ, Chosen by God Himself, the Hope of Muslims, Defender of Christians, I command you, the Zaborji Cossacks, to submit to me voluntarily, without resistance, and desist from troubling me with your attacks. The Cossacks mocking, insulting, and joyous response is seen in this laugh out loud masterpiece depicting the gathering of the Zaborzhi Cossack warriors hurling insults for the seated scribe to prepare their response to the Sultan. Major sections of the Cossack reply read. Thou Turkish Sultan, brother and companion to the devil, greetings. What the hell kind of noble knight are thou? The devil voids and thy army devours. Thy army we fear not. We will do battle against thee. Scullion of Babylon, wheelwright of Macedonia, beer brewer of Jerusalem, goat flayer of Alexandria, swineherd of Egypt, both upper and lower, thou sow of Armenia, hangman of Kamenets, thou grandson of the devil himself, thou great silly oaf of all the world, before our God, a blockhead, a swine's snout, a mayor's ass, butcher's cur. May the devil take thee, that is what the Cossacks have to say, Thou born of runts, unfit art thou to lord it over true Christians, and thou can kiss us where thou knowest where. Such is our answer. Repin began sketching ideas for the paintings. The first known sketch is seen here, drawn in 1878. He wanted total authenticity and visited the Zaporzhe region several times, painting the figures and faces of real Cossacks, genuine nomads of the open steppe. The text of the Cossack reply mimics all of the Sultan's self-proclaimed titles, virtually line by line. The figures reveal almost gorilla-like qualities, leathery-like skin, hardened by searing sun and brutal winters, handlebar mustaches, some wrapped over their ears, and a massive arsenal of weapons. 
The viewer can see the joy of camaraderie, the adrenaline of the moment, the thrill of their heroism. When the finished masterpiece was finally exhibited, one critic called it a symphony of laughter. Like so many nomadic people, the Cossacks did not survive the machinery of the modern age. The Cossacks have been viewed as a symbol of Russian stoicism and toughness, yet they are not really Russian. Moscow's persecution of them has often resulted in their fighting against Mother Russia. Stalin's appalling treatment of them by the time the German armies reached the Ukraine, thousands of Cossacks had joined the German ranks knowing Stalin's persecution would continue. In one of the war's most heinous betrayals, over 30,000 Cossacks surrendered to British forces in Austria on the promise they would not be repatriated back to Stalinist Russia. The assurances were broken by the British and thousands of Cossacks killed themselves, often wives and children as well, rather than returning to certain death. Upon those who did return, many were sent to gulags, while others were tortured, blinded, or thrown in vats of acid. Yet, another of history's ironies, Zaborzi Cossacks writing a mocking letter to the Turkish Sultan was Stalin's favorite painting. There is no debating whether eroticized images were painted, harem scenes, slave markets, etc., or thinly veiled references to colonialism, and even works by artists who never set foot in the Oriental world and created fantasies appealing to Western curiosity and heightened imagination. It is dangerous to generalize, but American artists who ventured into this part of the world were far less likely to produce these types of scenes. They did not represent the views of their government. Their potential clients in America didn't develop colonial tastes, nor were they as susceptible to eroticized subjects. Perhaps most importantly, very few ventured straight into these countries. Most were, at best, only vaguely familiar with the term or seen works of the genre. To the contrary, their exposure came because their intention was to first visit European centers to study art, improve their skills, and once there saw Orientalist paintings by their European peers and developed an excitement to visit this mysterious previously forbidden land and capture in paint what they witness. This was their main agenda. One of the earliest artists was Samuel Coleman, the highly regarded Hudson River School painter. He first visited Andalusia, southern Spain, which reflected the long Moorish presence and crossed over to Morocco in 1860 and 61. He returned again in 1872 and stayed for four years, painting in Algeria, Morocco, and Egypt. This piece, entitled Off the Coast of North Africa, reflects the usual entry to the region, was departing from Gibraltar for Morocco. Although this piece is not specifically located, a good guess would be approaching Morocco. The second work, entitled Desert Encampment shows a campsite of Bedouin complete with tents, camels, and upon a close inspection, guarding the group is a tethered desert lion. Off to the left is an indication of a river and mountains in the far distance. One would guess the scene is quite close to the Mediterranean, possibly Morocco or Algeria. This large mixed media example is more likely Egypt with a greater likelihood of ancient ruins scattered throughout 
the Nile Delta region. Samuel Coleman's contribution to Orientalism was impressive. And interestingly, years later, he collaborated with Lewis Comfort Tiffany on several projects, including the elaborate Havermeyer Estate in Greenwich, Connecticut, which showcased Coleman's Orientalist aesthetic. Master of the luminous style of the Hudson River School, Sanford Gifford visited Egypt and in 1869 traveled the Nile, where this work was painted, reflecting his preoccupation with atmosphere. Perhaps the masterpiece of his short two years stay is the Tomb of the Mamluks, located in the City of the Dead outside of Cairo. This extraordinary cemetery is believed to have been built in the 1350s and dedicated to the mother of Sultan Hassan. The Scottish immigrant James Fairman painted extensively throughout the US and Europe. He served as a colonel during the Civil War. This magnificent scene is the holiest of holy cities, Jerusalem, a glow with inspirational sunset effects and figures in the foreground approaching the city. In the biography on the artist entitled The Landscape of Belief, he's described as, quote, the foremost American painter of Jerusalem in the 1870s. Henry Roderick Newman was a uniquely talented and dedicated artist who followed the preachings of the British critic John Ruskin and his pre-Raphaelite approach of highly detailed style of painting. This image was painted in Abu Simbel, which we saw earlier. Newman suffered health problems and sought a more agreeable climate, which eventually led him to Egypt in 1889. He first lived on the tiny island of Philae in the Nile near Aswan known as the Pearl of Egypt. A moment to digress. This atmospheric image captures a sense of the island of Philae, circa 1870, painted by the French artist Theodore Frere. With the first construction of the Aswan Dam in 1902 and successive buildings in 1934 and 1964, this most concentrated site of spectacular ancient ruins were experiencing seasonal floods. With further construction of the Aswan High Dam, complete destruction of the site was guaranteed. In a rare example of international cooperation, aid was forthcoming through efforts of UNESCO, enabling the complex to be dismantled into 40,000 blocks and reassembled on Agilkia, a nearby and higher level island, thus saving one of the architectural wonders of ancient world. This is a watercolor of the magnificent Isis Temple complex entitled The Gateway of Philadelphus. Newman's work appeals not only for its art, but also he captures the polychrome hieroglyphic walls as they were intended before air pollution stripped them of much of their color. They are valuable contributions for Egyptologists. It is estimated that Henry Roderick Newman's painstaking, detailed, pre-Raphaelite style limited him to roughly eight paintings a year. Joseph Lyndon Smith was gifted, a writer, actor, producer of stage plays, friends with leading figures of the day, John Singer Sargent, Mark Twain, Amelia Earhart, and patrons like Isabella Stuart Gardner, in addition to his skills as an artist. Restless and a globe traveler, he visited Egypt in 1899 and found his life's calling. 
He visited and stayed with Henry Newman on Philae for a period. Found in Smith's papers is this rare photo of the island of Philae, circa 1900. He soon met the team of Egyptologists and archaeologists working on the famed exhibition site at Giza in the Valley of the Kings. His charm enabled him to talk his way into being allowed to enter the tomb chambers and paint detailed images of the wall reliefs and hieroglyphics, giving them a three-dimensional look on the flat surface of a canvas. These were totally unique and nothing ever like it had been seen. This is an image of a statue of Sekhmet, the lioness goddess, whose image we saw earlier in the work by the German artist Karl Werner. This piece was among the works that Smith regularly sent back to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, who mounted traveling exhibitions of these paintings, exposing the glories of ancient Egypt to the American public for the first time. Joseph Lyndon Smith's love for Egypt did not wane. He spent virtually every summer for the remaining 50 years of his life in Egypt, and the Egyptian Museum in Cairo honored him with four exhibitions of his work, never before granted to a living artist. A cultivated weirdness is how one critic of the day described Elihu Vedder, living a bohemian lifestyle in Greenwich Village. Known as a symbolist, a mystic, whose paintings were often derived from his dreams. An example, entitled Layer of the Sea Serpent, is one of many somewhat inexplicable works painted in mid-1870. It is a dream I would rather not be a part of. This somewhat disturbing image is entitled Sphinx of the Seashore, painted in 1871. The positioning of the figure is, quote, Sphinx-like in the composition, but the figure appears to be an Anglo woman with red hair, inhabiting the body of a large cat-like figure. This extraordinary work is entitled Questioner of the Sphinx, painted in 1863. This may be the best known painting among those basically unfamiliar with the Orientalist genre, given the frequency with which it's been reproduced over the past century and a half. It is the very essence of mysticism. It is a demonstration of the power of imagination, for it was painted two decades before Vedder ever set foot in the Orient, and yet does not diminish the importance of the piece. It represents pre-Christian world of multiple gods and goddesses with the belief that the Sphinx held secret wonders and riddles to be solved. The kneeling figure is, quote, the questioner, attempting to learn the secrets. After a four-year detour, working for his father in a dry goods store, Frank Waller was able to study at City College of New York, finally exhibiting his first painting at the prestigious National Academy of Design in 1870. In less than a year, he departed for France for further study and exposure to Orientalist paintings. Within a year, barely 30 years old, he was off to Egypt and rapidly became known for his painting scenes like this along the Nile, employing the style of luminism. His love of ancient Egyptian archaeological sites and ruins in the desert is brilliantly displayed in this scene of the sacred Lake Karnak, executed in 1873. Waller's stay in Egypt was too short. His promise as an Orientalist was well recognized. Upon his return to New York, he continued his interest in art and became one of the original founders of the Art Students League in 1875. 
and the Honorary Secretary of the Egypt Exploration Society. The name Harry Humphrey Moore was little known for half a century until a large cache of his paintings hidden in barrels prior to World War II were discovered in 1948. His life is nothing short of amazing and inspirational. Moore was close friends, painting and traveling companion with the great Thomas Aikens and was a pallbearer at Aikens' funeral. So impressed at seeing his work in an exhibition, the legendary John Singer Sargent stated, quote, never saw such exquisite technique, end quote. The great French painter and instructor Jean-Léon Jérôme wrote of his former student, quote, I'm proud of having been your professor. Moore was attracted to southern Spain, Andalusia, where he befriended the great Spanish artist Mariano Fortuny. Apparently his skills extended beyond just painting and cultivating important friends. Moore also cultivated several relationships with upper-class European ladies, some of royal birth. Now, all this is pretty impressive, but all the more so, Harry Humphrey Moore was born a deaf mute and communicated through sign. Moore spent several years in Segovia and Granada. This scene is the magnificent Alhambra in Granada, considered among the greatest preserved examples of Moorish architecture. Its construction began in 1238 and was added to over the centuries, but gradually fell into disrepair till eventually it was occupied by squatters. Strangely, the event that triggered international attention and serious reconstruction was Washington Irving's publication of Tales of the Alhambra in 1832. It is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This is the work by Moore entitled Leaving the Alhambra and represents a person of high rank given the figure beside him who appears to be kissing his robe. In 1872, Moore married an aristocratic Polish lady and moved to Morocco for two years. This work of a seated figure smoking reveals complex tile work that could be either Andalusia during the centuries of Moorish occupation or painted in Morocco. The last image is of a raucous group of Nawa street musicians. The Nawa people descend from slaves brought to Morocco from West Africa. Their music has survived, well preserved, and is practiced to this day as seen in this modern day performer. So what befell Harry Humphrey Moore's work and reputation? He spent the vast portion of his career outside of the US, thus not maintaining contact and patronage in his own country. He and his wife moved back to Paris where he passed away in 1926. She retained all his work. At the outbreak of World War II, she was arrested and sent to a concentration camp, but not before she could hide all his work. At the time Moore's work was discovered in 1948, he was a forgotten name. Ernest Wadsworth Longfellow if the name sounds familiar, it should. The son of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, one of our country's most revered poets. Born in Cambridge, Mass, educated at Harvard, Ernest was certainly from the privileged class of his day. His initial ambition was to enter West Point and follow his older brother, who served in the cavalry during the Civil War, but it ended while he was still in school. Little is known what prompted him to change his career goals, but after his studies in Paris, he began a lifelong pursuit of painting 
and traveled throughout Europe, the Far East, the Mideast, and the United States. His impressive exhibition records indicate works from Morocco appear in 1880 and 1881. The presumed dates of these works. First is the shadowy alleys and stairways with wonderful texture and light patterns on the buildings. And notice the support beams jutting out from the walls, a feature prominent in many of a sunny courtyard somewhere in Morocco. I don't know the location, but an almost identical composition was also painted by Samuel Coleman, whom we discussed earlier. Frank Penfold, born in Buffalo, departed for France in 1878 at 29 years old and made his lifelong home in Pont-Avon, France, a vibrant artist colony of the day. Unlike the artist we just discussed, Harry Moore, Penfold maintained close contacts with America and the art scene in Buffalo. On one of his ocean voyages, his ship had to outmaneuver a German warship. He was extremely productive, working in the preferred Barbizon style of the day. He specialized, often in monumental scale, in depictions of Breton peasants and fishermen. The French government acquired a piece of his work in 1882 for its national collection. This was only the second painting by an American purchased by the French government. This work, entitled The Flute Player of Algiers, was painted in 1887 during what is believed Penfold's only trip to North Africa. His focus was on the figure and its immediate surroundings, a reminiscent of his rural scenes in Brittany. Tragically, with the unexpected passing of his wife in 1921, a distraught Frank Penfold drowned himself in the nearby town of Concarneau. Hollywood Harrison Ford played Indiana Jones. Now meet the real Indiana Jones and he could paint. His name is Charles Wellington Furlong, born in 1874. One lengthy description of him reads, explorer, writer, college professor, lecturer, scientist, foreign correspondent, cowboy, movie star, military officer, intelligence agent, military advisor to Woodrow Wilson, participant in the Paris Peace Delegation post-World War I, emissary to King Faisal, friend and confidant to Teddy Roosevelt and T.E. Lawrence, and in his spare time, a painter. Documenting his 93-year life starts with being the head of the art department at Cornell from 1896 to 1904. Asked by Teddy Roosevelt to explore and document the region known as the Tripolitan Sahara, Furlong spent 1904 and 5 in Morocco and Libya, seeking the nomadic and rarely seen Tuareg Bedouin, known to roam the region at their will with little concern for national borders. He painted this image of a Tuareg encampment. The Tuareg wore face masks to keep out sand and reduce evaporation from the nose and throat. This is the only known other example of these elusive people to emerge from Furlong's trip. This two year long exploration and extensive documentation of all he saw led to one of his many books entitled Gateway to the Sahara. These two works by Furlong are as much ethnographic records as they are fine art. Admittedly, his contribution to Orientalist art is modest, but his life story is nothing short of a true American adventure, and it's worth telling. So, with your indulgence, let me get into it. Furlong next explored South America's starting at the southernmost tip at Tierra del Fuego. He made exhaustive notes, especially about the indigenous Ona and Yagan tribes 
who were being systematically killed by European settlers. These two paintings of an Onas tribesman on the move and the figure with his horse is from the Patagonian Pampas. They are both in the Smithsonian. The third image by Furlong is a Yagan magician preparing for a dance ceremony. Furlong's petitions to save these people predicted their extinction. They were ignored. As of the 1950s, they were declared officially extinct. Furlong continued exploring the 1500 mile long Orinoco River with detailed observations and reports. This five year period resulted in health problems and Teddy Roosevelt told him to go west to recover. Furlong begins ethnographical studies of the Crow and Blackfeet Indians in 1914. While in the Northwest, he responds to a cowboy's insult about being a quote, Eastern dude. And he enters the bull riding contest at the Pendleton Rodeo in Oregon. Having never seen a rodeo or a bull, Furlong stays aboard for 12 and a half seconds, setting a record that lasted for decades. He next leads a three-year expedition to West Africa for the Harvard Museum. At a layover in the Canary Islands, he unearths certain lost documents of Columbus's New World discovery. During this trip, the liner Lusitania is sunk, and he offers his services as an officer in the Massachusetts Naval Brigade. During World War I, he creates a geographic military intelligence division and writes extensive observations on Russia, Siberia, and the Mideast. In 1918, he's made a delegate at the Paris Peace Conference and serves as military aide to President Wilson and befriends T.E. Lawrence. In the mid-20s, finds Furlong as an intelligence officer in the Mideast, emissary to King Faisal, and appointed to the War College. In 1925, he writes about his Western adventures in a book entitled Letter Book. Universal Studios makes a silent movie about Furlong. Sadly, like half the movies made prior to 1950, it is lost. No copies of it have survived. Another two-year trip to South America, where he settles a boundary dispute between Peru and Chile and he visits the appalling prison in French Guiana. His follow-up report results in shutting down Devil's Island Penal Colony, depicted in the movie Papillon. In 1929 and 30, he's back in Africa, exploring Kenya, Tanganyika, the Belgian Congo, and Sudan. He was the first white man to live among the pygmies of the Eturic Forest and he finds the last surviving member of the Stanley Expedition. Throughout all this, he's constantly submitting articles on a staggering array of topics. 52 years after his bull riding episode, Furlong is invited in 1966 at 92 years old to be the Grand Master of the Pendleton Westward Ho Parade. Somewhere, he acquired expertise in Arctic exploration and he became the assistant curator of the Arctic collection at Dartmouth College in 1962. Now returning to Furlong's painting of the Toreg Bedouin, I contacted the curator of American Art at Dartmouth and sent an image of the painting and asked if she knew his name. A hesitant, I, I, I think I've heard his name but I'll get back to you. A day later, quote, you won't believe this. Our archives have 23 running feet of shelf space filled with all his papers. It's a treasure trove. Well, my immediate thought was, geez, if I was, if I was about 20 years younger, this story would be, quote, the long-awaited great American novel about the real Indiana Jones. The two giants of American Orientalism are Frederick Arthur Bridgman, painted throughout North Africa, and Edwin Lord Weeks, working in India. Both have been mentioned 
only briefly thus far, but will be presented in detail in our next episode. Our third segment will examine the life and work of the two most important American Orientalists. Both became permanent expatriates, one focused on North Africa and the second on India. Piety and prayer in the Islamic world was of great interest to the Western artists and one requiring great sensitivity. We'll examine how they interpreted this part of daily life. Women artists ventured into this once forbidden world, including the most beautiful woman in all of Europe with a scandalous life covering two continents, multiple marriages, divorces, and affairs from Europe to Damascus. Yet, with her disregard for Victorian convention and her courage, you will root for her. <laughs>